Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. My guest today is one of Europe's most assertive voices on the green transition and the need to complete the European Green Deal. Pascal Confin chairs the Environment Committee at the European Parliament. He's an ally of French President Emmanuel Macron and he is a member of the centrist Renew Europe group. He was a minister in the French government in 2012 to 2014, and he was also director of the French branch of the World Wildlife Fund from 2016 to 2019. Uh, he joins me in our studios in Paris. Thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you. L let's start with the, the COP that is happening in, in Dubai. I'm sure you heard the host uh, saying in his opening speech that fossil fuels have to be part of the climate solution. What signal does that send? Well, what is interesting is that this uh, fossil fuel debate mm. cannot be avoided even when the COP takes place in Dubai. So the good news is that this debate will take place in Dubai as well and not only uh, in Paris or in a non-oil uh, uh, producer country. So it's good that this scope, and I know that a lot of NGOs are, or academics are, had asked uh, the last weeks and days to boycott uh, the, the COP. I think it would be a mistake because we need to have this debate precisely in Dubai and in the Gulf. But do you think that when a high level uh, speaker, the host in fact, says something like that, is it encouraging countries to... Uh, perhaps slow down on the transition away from fossil fuels? I mean, if you're looking at the global picture. Well, you know, uh, beyond a politics, just look at the fact. And the fact is uh, the uh, IPCC, so the, the science of climate, uh, the IPCC report, that is saying that fossil fuel has to decrease. But of course, nobody is saying that we should stop it uh, overnight. Mm -hmm. And third that we will more and more to have the difference between what we called in the jargon abated and unabated fossil fuel. What does it mean? It means that when you burn oil, you can keep uh, uh, the uh, CO2 emitted when burning oil or gas and store the CO2 back uh, underground. This is a technology that can be used to decrease the emissions of fossil fuels. But of course, it is a small part of the solution. The largest part of the solution is just to move from fossil fuel to something else. So unabated and abated <coughs> fossil fuels, that is an important distinction. It's good that you, uh, you set that out. So how are we doing in the European Union? I mean, we've seen uh, fossil, uh, a big drop in the use of fossil fuels in the first half of this year in 2023 in the EU. But we also have some, some indications that we might not be on target for 2030 in our emissions in the EU. How do you read all of that? Well, because precisely we are now uh, right in the middle of the transition. I mean, a few years ago, before the Green Deal, we just started, but we, was, we were clearly not on track, for sure. Now we are back on track, but not sure to get there. Mm. So we are right in the middle. We can win this battle or we can lose this battle. Mm. Now that's why we need to keep on speeding up. And just it, it, to, to recall the fact that it is from a European perspective, it is very important, this climate battle, not only for obvious environmental reasons, but also from a geopolitical reason. We are, as Europeans, we are the poorest continent in the world in terms of natural resources. I mean, we do not produce oil and gas close to zero. So we import almost everything. It's a huge dependency, a huge dependency. So the more we green our energy system, again, mainly through renewables, energy efficiency, and nuclear for the countries who want to do it, the more independent we are. So on the, the Green Deal, uh, that consists of 75 pieces of legislation. Um, wh where do we stand on that now? What are the, the outstanding things that you think <coughs> really must be completed uh, by, by the European elections? What, what would be your priorities? Well, first, recalling the fact that we have already passed, secured, okay, finally adopted more than half of the Green Deal. And we are neg neg negotiating uh, the last, the second half, and we will probably close more than 80% of the total legislations we need 
to get and to reach the objectives you referred to mm. for 2030, decreasing our CO2 emissions by 55%. So now 80% of the work would have been done under this term. It's massive. It is completely unprecedented. Mm. I take one example for, for that, that speaks uh, in our everyday life, uh, cars. I mean, uh, we have set new rules that would lead us to zero emission cars being uh, sold uh, by 2035, 100%. So if you are not a zero emission car, you cannot be sold anymore and before we decrease progressively. So that's why it's a massive change, massive change. A couple of aspects of the, of the Green Deal which um, has been uh, criticised for uh, essentially watering down the original idea. Uh, one is the nature restoration law, and uh, I want to quickly read to you something that the WWF actually wrote, which is the organisation you used to lead here in, in, in France. It said that it's disappointing that so many exemptions have been included, there's excessive flexibility in obligations for member states, they're saying, and that this sets a frightening precedent for EU lawmaking because of the lack of legal safeguards. So it's a very good example, this nature restoration law, <clears throat> because it is the first ever European law and likely the first ever global law, not only to protect nature, meaning creating natural parks, for instance, but to restore nature when nature has been damaged and vanished. But you don't think that it's been no, no, watered no, no. down so much? It that was. It's... It was watered down compared to the initial mm. proposal. And I do regret it. But when you look, when you zoom back and you look at uh, the result, mm. it's a first ever global law restoring nature. Not only, again, uh, it's, it's the, the theoretical change is that we do not just protect nature, creating, for instance, marine uh, park, but restoring nature when it has disappeared. Yeah. It's a brand new thing. So that's why this new frontier mm. created a lot of tensions because some, let's start with farmers, said, well, if you want to restore nature, you will reduce uh, production for food. And then we entered into a very politicized and polarized debate. And it led us to find compromises that for some are already way too far, for others like WWF too low. But at the end of the day, to be honest, it was the only potential possible compromise. When the so-called pesticides law failed to yeah. pass in the European Parliament. That must have disappointed you a lot. Of course. So it's the only example uh, of failure, and I do regret it. And uh, why? Because for cars, for lorries, for industry, for energy, for renewables and so on, we passed the law because it is a de relatively depolarized debate. There is a consensus, including with the economic actors, with the companies concerned, to move forward because it is our values, but it's also our interest, as I said at the beginning. For, just for, for agriculture, for agriculture, it's not the case. And the problem is that it is too polarized. Let's talk a bit about the European election, which, yep. of course, your party is going to be contesting. In the 2019 elections, the far-right national rally came one percentage point ahead of you. Uh, do you expect them to do very well this time round because of the whole asylum and migration issue? Well, for the asylum migration issue, I can tell you that we are working very hard at the European level precisely to have harmonised rules for the first time. And we are close. That might be next week. If not next week, it will be in January. But we are very close, very close to find a deal that would allow us to have first a better treatment for from a human perspective of asylum seekers when they are ready asylum seekers and on the contrary when they are not when they can't claim this status then making sure that we control our borders mm -hmm. there are the two legs and for the time being we compete more or less between greece spain italy and so on so on. we don't have harmonized rules and sometimes there are loopholes we want to close this but again with the two legs not only the the, the border element, but also the human treatment element. Yeah. And, and we are close to this. We are close to it. And that will be very interesting to see in the campaign, that if we manage to get it right, mm. uh, the extreme right, which is in power in Italy, with uh, Madame Meloni, 
was f started very much against <coughs> that kind of uh, uh, treatment and that kind of uh, uh, um, packs in Europe. Now, in the European Parliament, all the parliamentarians coming from the Lega, from uh, the three parties in the uh, Italian government, voted in favour of this pact, which is, of course, the opposite of the extreme right in France. So that's why, as soon as you start being a bit in responsibility, the European solution is the only possible way forward. M M Maloney, and we, we will advocate this very much in the campaign. I, I'm sure course. you will, yeah. I mean, and obviously, uh, Giorgio Maloney would, would uh, dispute that label of extreme right. But in any case, just one final point, the, the Dutch election result, how worrying is this to you? So, of course, it is worrying. I'm not going to challenge it. F two lessons. The first one is that, let's say, I will call it extreme right. Uh, uh, very nationalistic parties can win, but also they can lose. Look at the Polish example. Look at the Spanish example. Last lesson I draw, uh, VVD, so the party in power uh, in, in, in Netherlands, uh, generated uh, these elections precisely on migration to be more radical. And at the end of the day, it's even even more, more, more radical that one. So as soon as you start playing on it, it is, I mean, at the end of the day, you lose. So that's why we, in the majority in France, we really want to keep this balanced approach. We'll have to end it there. Thank you so much for being my guest, Pascal Confin, head of the uh, Environment Committee in the European Parliament. I'll be back after a break with a debate about pesticides and herbicides, and we'll be focusing on glyphosate. Some more on that coming up. Do stay with us.